What's up you guys? Welcome to today's video. When I was in LA, I got to hang out a little bit with Freeway Ricky Ross. I absolutely love him, you guys. If you have not seen his documentary on Netflix, it's called Crack in the System. It's an amazing and eye-opening story of how a young man in South Central LA started selling drugs for the US government. I know that sounds crazy, but it's absolutely true. He was going through a million dollars worth of drugs every single day, and he got a federal life sentence for most that is a death sentence. That says you are going to die in federal prison. And the feds have like a 98% success rate. So you hear that and you're like, wow, what the hell? If I have piqued your interest, please go watch that documentary on Netflix. But he learned how to read in prison and got his sentence overturned. You guys, you cannot bury the real ones. Hustlers always find a way. And I will continue to be inspired and follow his journey. He has created a massive empire the right way since leaving prison. So, Rick, thank you so much for hanging out with me. I absolutely love your story. I love what you're doing today. I will leave all of his social media links linked down below as well as his book, the untold autobiography i love this book you guys he was actually kind enough to sign it for me when we first met in in chicago so again rick thank you so much for hanging out with me i really appreciate it and i'm again i'm so inspired by you so without further ado let's kick this thing off what's up you guys we are here with freeway rick ross the real rick ross thank you so much for hanging out with me for a little bit oh, come on you already know <laughs> I didn't give up. I didn't give up. No, you stay dedicated. Always, man. So let's tell everyone a little bit about you. You started a drug empire in the 80s, making millions of dollars every single week. And you started with- Every day. Every day. Yeah. You started with 50 bucks, 100 yeah. bucks. Well, 100, I had 125 and my partner had 125. Um, the first piece of cocaine that I got was 50 bucks though. Uh, and um, I got beat out of that. You got beat out of that? Yeah, I got beat out of that. But I didn't give up. Dedication. You know, Nipsey said it. Dedication. So how did you get beat out of it? They just, they robbed you? Uh, yeah, it was one of my partners. I didn't know what it was. You know, I, I was curious. Did I, was it really cocaine? Was it really worth 50 bucks? So I had a lot of- piece too, right? It was like smarter than a match head. So I had a lot of questions that needed to be answered. And, and uh, I started going around the people and it was so small that when they touch it, it it seems as if it disappeared. Yeah. <laughs> and so when I finally found somebody to, um, who knew what it was, uh, he tested it. And you know, once he tested it, it was literally almost all gone. He was like, I, right, yeah. I, I, give you, I give you the money Friday. Uh, Friday, they never come back. Never came back. <laughs> <laughs> well, he did, he came back. He brought me another customer and, and that really is what started my business to roll in. I mean, it's just crazy to think that you started with nothing, tiniest bit of nothing, and you, you evolved this huge empire. So I guess what I really want to know is what was it like to sell crack cocaine in South Central in the 80s? I mean, you really just kind of started this this massive... Well, it was kind of like, you know, when, when, when you, you feel hopeless, you know, how people get to the point and they, they, they feel like um, life is not what they always expected it to be, you know, no picket fences, uh, no rainbows, you know, not even the desire to own it in my own house, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. I never thought about owning my own house at that time. Um, I thought I could live the rest of my life in my mom's garage, you know, <laughs> like, that would have been cool with me, but... Uh, I relate a lot to that because you know, I grew up in a tiny little town in upstate New York. There was no opportunities, yeah. you know, and I, I sold drugs as well because I wanted to make money. So when you look around your neighborhood and you don't see you like... You sold drugs? Mm -hmm. You don't look like a drug dealer. Neither do you. We have that in common. <laughs> <laughs> Who does? But anybody can become a drug dealer, you know, and that's the point I try to make to these people who, uh, who are out here trying to um, prosecute, you know, everybody. Um, and throw away the key forever, you know, because a person makes a mistake. Um, we we all can make a mistake, and we all have made mistakes. You know, Jesus said it best in the Bible when he said he was never seen cast the first stone. Mm -hmm. But still, we have people out here casting stones and and prosecuting people for. Um, I, I believe in the drug scenario that everybody is equally culpable. 
Mm-hmm. And that means if you're a user, you're culpable. If you're a seller, you're culpable. If you're a um, aid and a better, you're just as culpable. If you're a grower and manufacturer, all of you all play a, use an essential uh, role in this web. Uh, and in order to stop this web, you have to somehow be able to influence all of the players that's involved. Yeah. And if you can't do that, then there's no way that you can stop it because if you stop one element, then the other elements are gonna figure out a way to put those elements back into place. So I love I love that. I love that you said that because it's true. Um, your your life led to a federal life sentence because of that. Absolutely. You know, it eventually snowballed into that. Um, after you took a six year break and you were not selling drugs, you completely left that lifestyle. Did you think that was gonna happen? Did you think a federal judge would hand you a life sentence? No, I didn't. I, I never in, in my wildest dreams would have thought that somebody would get a life sentence for selling drugs. Um, life without parole. Life without too. parole, yeah. Um, and, and I understand the point that they're trying to uh, to prove that, that drugs affect our community in, in, in a great way and, and it's a serious problem but uh, we can't continue to fight the war on drugs the way we've been doing it because it, it hasn't worked for 50, 60 years, you know, um, it hasn't worked. So um, we have to come up with new strategies yeah. and, and, and new ways of, of, of handling this. I mean, um, it's almost like right now with the legal marijuana, how one day it was illegal and now it's legal. And the people who used to lock people up for selling it is now wanting to control all of the licenses and, and, and the distribution and everything uh, about it. You know, it's like crazy. Like It's funny how that works when they see the dollar signs, you know, then they're like, oh, hold up. Now I want to do it this way. I yeah, want to have a, a hand yeah. in the market. Yeah, and then the people who, uh, who fought to legitimize it and who fought because they knew that they had the right to smoke marijuana and we all should have the right to do whatever we want to do with ourselves mm-hmm. as long as we're not imposing on anybody else's will, you know. Um, it should be perfectly fine to do whatever you want to do to yourself. There is a danger involved in that and I completely understand it, but we have enough data now that states the war on drugs does not work. We have a generational problem, we have a socioeconomic problem. So I have a two-part question. Um, do you think race is involved in the war on drugs? Oh, absolutely. Race is involved in this country in every aspect. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't you can't get around race. Uh, and you know, people say, "Oh, well, you know, it's not racist." Yeah, it is racist. You have to be black in order to understand. You know, uh, being made sit on the curb just a couple of weeks ago, a cop tried to make me sit on the curb, you know? Really? And they took me to jail for uh, uh, interfering with an investigation because I told him that I'm not going to sit on the curb. So, and, and he felt offended. And I was like, well, you just, I would feel offended if you tried to make me sit on the curb. <laughs> right? And I got my ID, I got insurance, you know, driver's license, I'm like... So there's no reason for him to do oh, that? Oh, no, not even a reason. His reason was that, that my son was on parole, so that gave him a reason to do whatever he felt was, was necessary and, and, and uh, uh, I said that's crazy and by the way this Vlad in my case the cops planted drugs on me the cops were not my partner you know I heard an interview yesterday uh, with Vlad was interviewing Bootsy and he was like asking Bootsy was, was I a snitch and I was like um, he didn't explain the question to Bootsy right mm-hmm. the question was uh, I told on some cops. Yeah, I told on cops that planted drugs on me, that uh, um, were not my friends, we were not partners. They were trying to put me in prison for the rest of my life on false evidence. And I got on the witness stand and I said that it was false evidence. Absolutely. Yeah, that's completely different <laughs> than snitching. And, and I'll do that again. Because anybody that goes to court is fighting against the cops and they want to find dirt on the cops. Right. I mean, I, I was put in prison and I wasn't even Mirandized. They didn't read me my rights, nothing. You know, so just based on that alone, that should have been thrown out. 
Yeah. But they don't <coughs> But the cops, they're gonna say they read them to you. Mm -hmm. you know? Absolutely. Oh, yeah, I read her rights. I think the average person doesn't really understand the corruption and how people are treated. You know, even though even though you were out, you were you're completely legal driving around because your son is on parole. That gives them the right to tear apart your car, try to put you on the curb. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. it's it's happened so many times, and I'm glad that you didn't go to jail for standing up for yourself. You know, they took me to jail. Oh, did you just say that? Yeah, they did took me to jail. You? They took me to jail. But I, you know, it's something that uh, that I felt was necessary. You know, I feel like it's a lifelong process after you have a felony on your record. You know, you're you're constantly harassed. They just had a report from LAPD just the other day where they were saying that blacks are ten times more likely to be searched if they stop their car than a white. And even though whites have contraband more than blacks, but the cops don't look at it like that. You know, and, well, you know, most of the cops don't look like me. You know what I'm saying? So uh, if people would tend to look at, and, and, and uh, so many people are not colorblind. You know, they say, oh, we colorblind. No, they're not colorblind. They absolutely see color and they react to it. So um, part of living in this country, you know, we, we gotta be more um, peace and love and, and, and not separation, looking for reasons to be divided and, 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 and separated. And that's why the people who are running this country run the country because the people um, on the bottom allow them to keep us separated. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. So what can we do moving forward with the war on drugs? Yes, drugs are dangerous. Yes, they're very addictive. Yes, we need to not have them in our communities, but do you think it's fair to put, do you think it would be fair to legalize all drugs and only drug dealers and drug traffickers go to prison versus the no, user? No, that won't work. No? So what do we do? You have to, you have to, you can't win this with, with incarceration. Mm -hmm. Incarceration, that nah, is don't work. I knew guys were in prison planning their big move when they got out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they met some Colombians and, you know, was, so, so you can't, you can't incarcerate your way out. We got to educate our kids. We, we want, we should be, what we, we should be thinking about is how can we get to where if somebody dropped a mountain of heroin off, how could we get our kids to walk by and say, look, some dummy had hair on and couldn't do nothing with it, mm. so he dumped it. Just like they do trash. Right. And that's what it should be. They should be knowing what it is. And don't lie to them. You know, a lot of times we, we lie to our kids and um, our kids just don't believe what we say, you know? You know, like they, they used to say, uh, you know, using drugs was like frying your brain and then when they see their kid, their friends who are not, uh, who was using drugs, brain is not fired, then they like, oh, they lied to me. Yeah, we're demonizing drugs. That does not work. No. You know, I think people need to know why they're so attractive and addictive. They need the truth. You know, I never had that conversation. And then with, with the schools, our schools are uh, contradictory too because they'll let the rappers come in and rap mm -hmm. about how much drugs they sold. And then when somebody comes in who's actually was a drug dealer, they won't let them in. Have you ever been in any schools and spoke? No. They were just right there. They should be seeking you out. Your old schools and uh, areas should want you to come in and tell the kids about uh, the life. So. Yeah. I mean, they, they need to know what it's really like. It's ugly. You know, I, um, I wanted to be a kingpin. And what ended up happening is I'm an addict. So it just, it teared my life apart, it teared my family's life apart. So I'm gonna ask you a hard question. And you can get mad if you want to. <laughs> what, um, how do you feel when critics say that you single-handedly destroyed South Central in the 80s with crack? Well, and if they say single-handedly, that's not true because it wouldn't be just my single hand. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people involved in the drugs, you know, all the way from the White House, you know, all the way down to each crack addict. And if you guys have not seen Crack in the System, it's a Netflix special. I will leave a link to it down below, as well as all of your merch and hopefully your upcoming podcast. Hopefully I can get a link to that as yeah, well. No but doubt. yeah, you need to hear his story. Sorry for interrupting. No, you're talk. good. You're good. Go ahead. You're good. Um, yeah, uh, definitely check out my documentary. But that's that's really how I handle it. Uh, uh, 
I mean, if, if you're going to start p pointing the finger and blaming people, then you have to go, you point the finger at me, then you have to say, okay, now we're going to point the finger at the guy who taught me. Then you got to point the finger at the guy who taught him. So, so you just keep going on and on and on, and, and, and it, it's, it's, it's an ever-ending uh, thing if you just want to find blame. No, let's find solutions. You know, yeah. I'm, I'm more solution driven than, than than point of blame. Okay, blame me, I take it on the chin and I'm going to keep on pushing. <laughs> you check me out too on my social media, Freeway Ricky. Also, I got the Millionaires Club where I'm going to teach 250 people how to become millionaires. See my new shirt. I have to get one of those. I just saw you post that on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> I got the sweatshirts out, especially for y'all in the cold areas. I got the really, really nice sweatshirts. I'm selling them really cheap. The only problem is that I'm at the end of the barrel, so the colors are limited, sizes are limited. So go to my website as soon as you can and get your shirt, freewayrickyross.com. I'll leave everything for him down below. Um, so essentially, you were selling crack cocaine for the U.S. government. That's what they say. When you say it like that, it sounds insane. And you had no idea it was at that level until no, you went to prison? I didn't know. You also learned how to read in prison. I taught myself how to read. Read over 300 books. What was that like? Was it frustrating to have to teach yourself how to read? Because you're in prison. Like, it's already stressful. It was It was necessary. Yeah. You know, it was necessary for me to learn how to read in order for me to get out. And if I didn't learn how to read, I would still be in prison. And I did not want to be in prison. Also, y'all better get active in them cities with the marijuana. Otherwise, you're going to be left out. They're giving out those licenses. Big corporations are coming to your city. They're going to try to take the license from you and you will be out of work. So California recently legalized that. So how's that going for not, you? Not, not, not recently. recently. It's been 20 years. I'm old. I'm, I'm done. <laughs> California has been legal 20 years. We just went wreck uh, uh, in January. Right. That's what I meant. Well, I'm up for a license right now. Um, people are saying my chances look good. Even though you're a convicted felon? Yeah, even though okay. they were convicted felons, they made the law here where convicted felons could get a license. Because everybody involved in the business at one time was doing it was illegal. So uh, now it's legal. Why shouldn't felons and, and anybody else be allowed to participate in, uh, in such a lucrative market? It's so important that we just change how we even view drug laws and felons because when you get out of prison, you have that mark on your record. It's impossible to find jobs and housing. It's really hard. So we just have a vacuum. So you go to prison, you get out, you need to make money. And when you're a hustler, like we were, like it's hard to get away from that lifestyle. You want that you know? hustle. You want that hustle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We need to, you know, we need to help people in prison understand that they have an amazing gift. And if we harness it correctly, they could come out and do amazing things, which you have done. And I'm beyond proud of you and inspired by you. And I just love your whole story. <laughs> So is there anything else you want to share before? No, I just, uh, uh, you know, anybody out there trying to get at me, they want me to speak or whatever, uh, they can just hit me up on one of my social medias or, or, you know, I go to my website. All right. Well, thank you so much for hanging out with me again. I'll leave all of Rick's information in the description box down below. The first thing you guys have to do is watch his documentary and then buy his merch and follow him on social and media. Join the Millionaire Club. Please join the Millionaire Club. All right, give me a hug. Thank you so rich. much. I know you're going to join the Millionaire Club. Hell yeah, of course. You got to. Yeah, because we, we're from the same club. Yep, hustlers got to stay gonna, together. We're going to be kingpins in another way. <laughs>